Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Maria Luisa Stasi. Isa is a competition lawyer by training and head of law and policy for digital markets at Article 19, where she contributes to the development of the organization's policies with regards to digital and media markets, as well as the internet infrastructure. In addition, she provides legal support to the organization's regional offices on digital rights and media policy issues. Isa is also a researcher at the Tilburg University focusing on pro-competitive remedies for free expression challenges in social media markets. So Maria Luisa or Isa, you know about our three plus one format. You get three questions and one soapbox moment at the end. Um, so let me put the first question on screen and read it out. What does protecting media freedom mean to you? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, so let's start immediately from this uh, uh, first question. Media freedom is a fundamental pillar of democracy. Uh, without media freedom, uh, journalists and media, they cannot uh, perform their watchdog function. Um, circulation of ideas is limited. Um, essential information can be kept in the dark um, or some essential information can be hidden or even worse, lies can be told. Uh, without any accountability. Um, without media freedom, it's also very, very difficult to express uh, your own opinions, especially if they're not the mainstream opinion, or if they, if they challenge the mainstream opinions. Uh, so basically, media freedom is a home, is something that is essential uh, for two of the fundamental rights that underpin everything we do, which, is, uh, which are freedom to know and freedom to speak. Um, so it's uh, it's key. It's uh, something uh, major um, of major importance in in society and in democracy. Yet, um, data show that roughly 13, 14 percent of people in the world they have access to uh, to free media, uh, which is uh, of course a huge problem. And this goes across the entire globe. And the EU, uh, the European Union, unfortunately, is not um, is not an exception. Uh, so. This is a crucial task, and we need a variety that need a variety of solutions and a variety of components. Um, I'll focus here because I have very limited time on three. Let's see if, if, if those three uh, work. Uh, the first one is we need a solid regulatory framework. We need rules that protect media independence uh, and protect media, uh, media freedom, media independence from power, not only political power, but any form of power in society, any powerful interest. We need to impede that the media is captured, is instrumentalized. We need to free the media from economic dependency. Um, because economic dependency very, very often, if not uh, always, translate into limits to the, the editorial line. Uh, so this is the first, the first thing we, we need. The second one is we need to protect journalists and sources. We need to protect them from threats, from attacks, from vexatious litigation that are initiated only with the aim to silence them. Uh, so we need a proper environment for journalists uh, to perform their essential function for society. And then we need transparency about media ownership and financing. We need people and businesses, everybody, to know where the information comes from, uh, who owns or controls the media, the radio, the broadcaster, the newspaper that we're reading. Um, and we need uh, to pay attention to diversity and pluralism of the media. Uh, media freedom and media plurality, they go and, and in hand. They uh, reinforce each other. Um, if we don't have sufficient plurality of voices, of sources, um, it's difficult to consider the, the media uh, very, really free. So that's why we also need to put a sort of a cap on the concentration in the market, the high concentration in the market. We need rules for that. Um, and we need rules that support and encourage the variety of voices in, in society. Um, second point, all these very important and essential rules, they need to be uh, properly applied. We have a long list of examples of good rules that are never applied in practice. And this is a problem, uh, of course. Uh, so in order to have a good enforcement of those rules, we need to have independent authority, in authority that are accountable, authority that have the, the needed budget and skills and expertise, uh, and uh, the powers to perform their job. Um, so all this is absolutely essential. We can't have one without, uh, without the other. And finally, we need to pay 
adequate attention to the media sector. The media sector is not like every other sector in society. Information is a public good. So we cannot consider the media only as a sector of economy. It has a huge cultural, societal, and political component that we need to pay attention to, where we need to respect and protect, which means we need to pay attention to media sustainability. We need to pay attention to ethical codes for journalism. We need to make sure that journalists uh, have access to adequate training and funding and protection, as I said. We need to make sure that the general public has the sufficient skills to and, and capacity and um, and tools to access uh, information, to engage with information. Um, and so we need media literacy policy, digital and non-digital, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all those, I would say, are three essential components to protect media uh, freedom. Thank you, Isa. Um, so no capture uh, either by uh, political powers or by uh, money, <laughs> more generally. <laughs> Um, more transparency, uh, not just rules, but enforcement, independent regulators uh, that have the capacity <laughs> to regulate and to enforce, um, which, which is often forgotten. Um, and um, making sure that media is treated um, not just as a business, but also uh, taking into account its public interest function to a certain extent uh, towards democracy and acting as a light in the dark in certain cases. Um, I think you've already hinted at some of this, but if you look at our second question, what should the EU legislators do or do better to protect media freedom? Yeah, well, let me start by saying that uh, there's been a sort of a hype of attention on media issues at the EU level, at least in the last couple of years. Um, in April 2022, the European Commission came out with this proposal on, on SLAPS, Strategic Litigation Against Public Participation, which is a very uh, useful and essential component in the protection of journalists. Um, also because these SLAPS are a quite diffuse phenomenon in Europe, unfortunately, across the United States. Um, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, to a certain extent, they might also uh, help to create a more uh, diverse uh, environment for information and content more in general to circulate in society uh, and following certain uh, basic rules. Uh, but yet there is no disruptive, I would say, provision in those frameworks that uh, truly and fundamentally guarantees um, freedom and independence of the media. Uh, nor pluralism, actually. Uh, so I would say that the Media Freedom Act is still the core instrument that we need uh, to protect media freedom. And uh, this, I suppose, is clear uh, to the EU legislators. But going into a little bit more details of what could be the key recommendation or the key rules in this um, soon to be uh, legislative proposal. Um, I've mentioned some, yes, transparency of media ownership and, and financing. Uh, I said uh, already that it's uh, absolutely essential that everybody knows uh, where the news come from, who is behind, who has the control, um, the real control, not only the formal control of uh, this, the, the media or the broadcaster, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in fact, this is important because this sort of transparency needs to be for all. So the information needs to be accessible for everybody, not only for regulators, but also for businesses and for people. Um, the, Transparency needs to cover every kind of information that is needed for this purpose. Um, and uh, it needs data needs to be provided in a comparable way. So in an we need harmonized criteria. So I need, as, a, as a, an Italian citizen, I need to be able to access the same kind of information about an Italian media or um, a German media and vice versa. Uh, so this is uh, definitely key. The second one is uh, a media plurality test. So nowadays, uh, mergers and acquisitions are scrutinized either at the European Commission level or at national level by the national competition authorities based on their impact on competition dynamics in the market. And that's it. Uh, there are very few exceptions uh, across the European member states, uh, but those are exceptions, as I mentioned, and they're not harmonized. Uh, each goes in a slightly different direction. Um, it's fundamental that when we have these mergers and acquisitions, we also consider the impact that they're going to have on plurality and diversity in the media market. So it's fundamental that this sort of 
plurality test is introduced and it's applied uh, in a normalized way across the European member states. Um, this is absolutely something that uh, I hope, we hope uh, to see in the Media Freedom Act. Um, another element is uh, we need rules that guarantee fair allocation of state resources. Um, the allocation of state resources is essential to guarantee sustainability of the media. So it's a, um, it's a very welcome uh, element of the media ecosystem. Uh, yet, uh, if we look at how this happens in the different member states, there are different rules uh, concerning uh, the amount of uh, public fund that is dedicated to the media, uh, the way it is allocated to the media, uh, the reasons why it is allocated to the media, and this creates a lot of distortions, of course. Even uh, more problematically, um, it's not only an economic distortion, but it can it can um, once again be used to reward uncritical uh, media and or to silence uh, opposing voices. Mm. Uh, so once again, we have the interplay between the economic component and the the, the, the other component that is essential for democracy. Uh, so to have uh, harmonized rules uh, that ensure that this sort of a uh, public support is given in a fair and non-discriminatory way and in a transparent way is going to be, uh, again, very, very key. Thank you, Isa. So, um, detailed transparency available to the public. Um, the, looking at uh, consolidation and mergers, not just from an economic slash competition point of view, but also from, from a plurality point of view and making sure that uh, when money goes from the state um, to media, be it through subsidies, advertising, whichever form, um, that that is done um, in a transparent and I would say probably sustainable and efficient manner, not just as a, a, a carrot or a stick. <laughs> To, to control what media says. Uh, and I'm pretty sure all journalists will agree uh, with you on that one. Uh, and uh, looking now at a more, um, I wouldn't say a negative way, but we, we know that there's always risks when you regulate, that you're not doing enough, but also that you're doing maybe too much. Um, what are the pitfalls that EU legislators should avoid when trying to protect the media and our freedoms? This was very hard to select, I have to say, <laughs> but um, um, let's let's give it a try. So the first one is do not regulate content. When legislators directly intervene on the content, media freedom uh, is at risk and um, the risk of censorship, censorship is too high. Uh, so the only limits to the media freedom have to be based on international standards for free expression. So there are some cases where we can limit this, but they're very uh, limited and uh, it's essential to follow international standards on that. Uh, the good part of this story is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel because those standards are out there and they can be easily used and translate into um, uh, regulatory frameworks. So the second one would be uh, make sure that uh, the good rules do not remain dead letters. So basically enforce the rules once again. I know I've said that before, but it's really, really key. To shape and issue good rules is part of the story, half of it, the other half is to enforce it. So it would be a tremendous pity to make a lot of effort to shape good rules, but then not to enforce them properly. Also, it will create an environment of unaccountability that is extremely detrimental. Once again, that dichotomy, it's detrimental for the economy, um, and it's detrimental for society and democracy. Um, so once again, we can achieve two objectives with one tool. Um, the third one would be, uh, don't miss the opportunity, be brave. Um, media freedom, independence and pluralism are a problem in the European Union. There, there are a number of critical situations that need to be solved and need to be solved soon. And national systems and the current, ex the existing EU framework have proved not to be enough for that. So we do need uh, a different um, setting. We do need new rules. Uh, and it's not a minor issue. Uh, I've tried to convince you at the beginning that media freedom is essential. Um, and um, I am I'm strongly convinced that without independence of the media, variety of voices and without quality journalism, uh, it's going to be 
very, very difficult to set the condition for the EU values to flourish. So this is a, a, something we need to do for the European project more in general. Um, I think uh, the uh, so that, that's why that's why I think that the media freedom act needs to be um, taken as an opportunity uh, for businesses, for the people, and for the European Union in general as a project. I'm not, I'm not sure I want to recap everything you said because be brave seemed to be <laughs> the most important one to 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 a certain extent. Um, because, um, yes, uh, feel good legislation with no teeth uh, or, or that does not get transposed is, is nice, <laughs> but obviously not satisfying uh, on the ground. So, um, yeah, let's let's stick to be brave to summarize that answer <laughs> and hope that they listen. And, and it's a nice switch, actually, to, um, you know, your, the, the, the last moment, the, the apotheos uh, where you have two minutes uh, to deliver a message to Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, Roberta Metzola, President of the European Parliament, two strong women. Uh, and, you know, this, this take the floor. This is your moment. Let's hope their cabinets listen and take notes. <laughs> okay. Well, um, let me start by saying, uh, once again, the media freedom challenge in the EU is real, is crucial. And it's not something that is going to be solved by market dynamics per se, and it's not something that is going to be solved by technological developments. Uh, we cannot overcome media freedom challenges with a new or better algorithm or uh, more AI tools for journalists. We need more. Uh, and media freedom is at the foundation of the EU project, of its value. It has a huge uh, role in the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, so as such, it needs, as a challenge, it needs to be taken seriously. It needs an, uh, a complex uh, response and harmonized across the member states. Um, in fact, no solution will work if each member state acts independently and goes in slightly different direct directions or very different directions. It won't work for democracy and it won't work for the economy either. Uh, because fragmented responses won't lead, will lead definitely to fragmented markets. So it's not only the European democracy, which is at risk, but it's also the European internal market projects um, and the European society. Uh, I think this is the key way to look at what we want to achieve with the Media Freedom Act. If we stick on this key way, then how the rules need to be shaped is going to be an easier task. Not an easy task, but an easier task. So basically, um, keep your eyes on the end objective and tailor all tools towards that end objective is, is the advice. Let's hope they, they hear you. Um, we, we'll see that at the moment it's still scheduled for mid-September, but you know, this is Brussels. We will see um, by the time the podcast comes out, we will know. <laughs> um, and um, I think this is the beginning of a conversation. I think we will continue the conversations one, uh, once a document is available. And, um, you know, I hope you, the elements you've outlined are there, or if they are not, I hope they will get into the document as the legislative process uh, deploys. Thank you very much, Isa, for your time. Thank you very much for the opportunity.